Hello and welcome to Dove Biology Apes Lessons to Go. In this video, we'll be exploring the various sources of fresh water. As populations grow, uh, there are certain resources that we will need to have ample supply in order for us to live sustainably into the future. One such resource is water. So just how much water do we have to access to drink? Well, if you can imagine that we could take all the world's water and put it into a pitcher equal to about one gallon. This is what we would have. Now, unfortunately, the vast majority of that is actually going to be salt water, which is not drinkable or usable um, on crops. The actual proportion that we might have access as fresh water would be equal to three four ounce glasses. Now, unfortunately, two out of those three glasses are frozen, so we don't have access to them either. And our one, one and a half ounce uh, glass, a lot of that water is going to be locked up underground, so the water that we have currently have access to to drink might be equal to that of just one uh, M&M candy, which doesn't seem like a whole lot, which uh, really uh, emphasizes how important it is for us to conserve this essential resource. Now, we get our fresh water basically from two major sources, our groundwater and our surface water. Uh, groundwater is going to be our primary source, uh, making up about 99% of the water that we use. And then the surface water from lakes, rivers, and reservoirs would take up the rest of that. We use the bulk of our water in agriculture. 70% of all water that we use is used for irrigation followed by industries and cities at 20%, and then uh, residential uh, use is only about 10%. So what is groundwater? Well, groundwater is the water that infiltrates into the ground and then is stored in the porous rock and soil. Now, there are certain factors which allow for the water to infiltrate into the ground and then percolate through as our groundwater. One of those characteristics is porosity. And porosity is how much of a uh, soil or rock is pore space, the little spaces in between the rock. Um, and then our other major factor is the permeability, how interconnected those pores are. So the more porous and the more permeable um, our rock and soil substrates will be, the easier it is for water to then enter into the soil and then move through. Later on in this uh, unit, we'll actually revisit uh, these two concepts and uh, explore them even further. Now, some areas, um, their uh, rock and soil makeup is a little bit different, like if we go over into the Shenandoah Valley. A major component of the, the rock in the Shenandoah Valley is limestone. As the slightly acidic rainwater uh, percolates into the ground, it actually helps to kind of break down that limestone, creating sinkholes and uh, caves. This environment with a lot of sinkholes and karst as a result of that breakdown is called karst topography. Now the water as it goes into the ground kind of creates a, an aquatic profile, so to speak, and that we can identify the various components of this what we call a water table. Now at the top um, where we have our spaces in between the soil and rock that are near the surface, where we don't find a lot of moisture, this is going to be called the zone of aeration. This is the area that's going to have all the little air spaces, which is going to allow for the water to actually infiltrate uh, from the rain into the ground. Below that, at a certain depth, we're going to actually start to see where the water is filling in. And this is going to be called the zone of saturation. So we're saturated with water, and usually that zone of saturation is actually going to end up to be level with surface water. So wherever you have your surface water, that's probably going to match up with the top of that zone of saturation. And that actual top of the zone of saturation is going to be called our water table. Now that complete zone of saturation, we're going to refer to as an aquifer. So these aquifers are basically big storehouses of water. Now, some of the aquifers are what we call unconfined aquifers. Um, they uh, sit near the surface, and the only thing that separates them from uh, the surface is the layers of soil on top, and those layers of soil are permeable. Water can actually come in from the surface and get into that unconfined aquifer. 
Some aquifers, as the water flows underground, it encounters a uh, really, really dense clay that's impermeable, uh, which we call a confining layer. Um, and if it's impermeable, um, we call that an aquitard. And so water that is unable to move because it's confined um, in that space is going to be called a, conf a confined aquifer. So how might we access this groundwater? Well, there's a couple different ways. Sometimes the groundwater itself actually just kind of breaks through and starts uh, coming out from the ground in the form of springs or seeps. Really, the only difference between these two is that springs tend to have a little bit more uh, pressure behind them than just a seep. Another uh, way that we might access groundwater is uh, by tapping into an artesian system. Confined uh, aquifers are oftentimes under pressure, and when you break through, it starts to release that pressure, and that um, water actually is going to flow in what we call an artesian well. We can also uh, produce traditional wells that aren't under pressure um, by actually inserting a, a pipe and then a pump so that we're able to pump the water out. Um, unfortunately, if we pump the water too fast that it doesn't replenish, the ground itself can uh, subside. It's called a subsidence, uh, forming what's known a cone of depression. Um, notice here in this particular image, uh, this farmer had three wells. Unfortunately, because of how he was pumping the water out, we had this cone of depression form, which actually dried up some of his wells, and so perhaps he had to um, dig a deeper well so that he could access that water again. So um, the way that we uh, kind of balance the ability of the groundwater to recharge with our uh, withdrawal is really, really important. Another major source of fresh water is going to be surface water. Surface water is the water that doesn't sink into the ground or evaporate into the air. Instead, it runs off into bodies of water. Now, we're currently using more than half of the world's reliable runoff of surface water and could be using between 70 to 90 percent by 2025. Now, about 70 percent of the water that we withdraw from rivers and lakes don't return to these sources. So we're transferring water from one place for use in another, which is severely disrupting the water's natural cycle. Now the land from which the surface water drains into a body of water is called its watershed. The land area then that would be drained by major rivers in these watersheds are called basins. The Mississippi River Drainage Basin is the world's second largest, draining 4.7 million square kilometers of land. The Mississippi River watershed actually encompasses 40% of the contiguous United States. All of that land area, as it's draining into these uh, tributaries of the Mississippi, is bringing pollutants and uh, sediment into uh, the Mississippi, which is going to impact that particular uh, waterway. And then as that water drains into the Gulf of Mexico, it will also be impacted. Watersheds are named for the major river to which the surrounding land drains. Charlottesville is in the Rivanna River watershed, which is part of the larger James River watershed, which is part of the enormous Chesapeake Bay watershed, represented in this particular diagram by the darker green area. Both natural events and human activities will affect watersheds. Natural events such as storms, fires, and droughts can suddenly alter a watershed's condition at large scales. While some natural events have negative impacts, these events are often critical for long-term ecological health. For example, a fire may damage a forest, but it also rejuvenates a forest by spreading the seeds of key species and adding necessary nutrients to the forest floor. Individual human activities typically have smaller and more predictable impacts, but their cumulative impact can be far greater. Increases in population, land development, and economic activity increase the demands for water, waste disposal, and raw materials. These activities increase pollutant releases into water and air and degrade or fragment natural habitats. 
Without appropriate management, these changes can seriously compromise watershed health. And we might call those watersheds then impaired. When we evaluate these watersheds, we can decide what is causing their major impairment. Is it a biological impairment, like the presence of fecal coliform bacteria um, or E. coli bacteria? Is it a chemical impairment, like uh, the presence of uh, al uh, something that's altering the pH or how much dissolved oxygen is present? In Albemarle County, we have a number of watersheds that are actually classified as impaired. There are several strategies which we can employ in order to improve the quality of our watershed. One uh, technique is the use of green roofs. Green roofs are modifications to roof systems in which plant material uh, or even small gardens are going to be grown on rooftops. The presence of this plant material allows for the absorption of rainwater so it doesn't run off and down the gutter and be a part of an urban runoff. Uh, this is an image of the county office building downtown and the green roof that they have established there. Another way to protect a watershed is by implementing the use of stormwater ponds. Stormwater ponds, uh, like the one pictured here, which is the Dell Stormwater Pond at UVA, or even the stormwater pond that's behind our own school, is there to help decrease the flow of water, so it uh, slows how much water is leaving the land, which is going to decrease erosion. Another great uh, implementation would be the use of rain gardens or forested riparian buffers. These rain gardens are going to collect the water, slow the water as it moves off the land, and hopefully absorb toxins and pollutants uh, before it enters into major uh, streams and rivers. Additionally, when you're able to slow the runoff, it gives an increased chance for that water to infiltrate into the ground and recharge our overall groundwater. As populations grow, the need for water and water resources is going to increase as well. By understanding how we could protect and allow for this potentially renewable resource uh, to renew itself, we will ensure that we will have this precious resource for our future.